Hi everyone, welcome back to Spine Guy. I'm Dr. Brian Sula, fellowship trained spine surgeon in Marin, California. The Spine Guy is a channel dedicated to making the complex spine simple for patients to understand. On the last video, we talked about the signs and symptoms of cervical radiculopathy, which now you know means a pinched nerve in the neck that could be causing shoulder blade pain or pain coming down the arm all the way to the hand. Today we'll be talking about how I typically treat patients with a pinched nerve without surgery. And the reality is 90% of patients with a pinched nerve can be treated without surgery quite successfully. I'll be posting new videos weekly, so hit the subscribe button to catch them as they come out. Just as a reminder, a pinched nerve in the neck typically comes from one of two things, either a bone spur or a disc herniation. In older patients, it's typically a bone spur, and the younger athlete, it's typically a disc herniation. As a review, this is the side view of the neck. There's the back of your neck. There's the front of your neck. And these are the foramen or windows where the nerves come out. So what can happen is a bone spur can grow and pinch the nerve or a disc, which is the cushion between the bone can herniate. And this means that a disc is like a jelly donut. So the donut layer tears and the jelly spits back and it hits the nerve. The reality about a pinched nerve in the neck is that 90% get better within 90 days, even if you don't do anything. There are some great studies to show that at one year time point, when you compare patients that didn't have surgery versus patients that had neck surgery for a pinched nerve causing arm pain, both groups basically do the same. I'm not saying that you should never get surgery for a pinched nerve in the neck, but what I'm saying is you better try everything you can to avoid surgery and give it a good three months before choosing to have surgery because they almost really always do get better over time. And again, just because you have a pinched nerve in the neck from a bone spur doesn't mean we have to treat the pinched nerve. We're treating the patient, not the MRI. So it doesn't matter to me that the MRI is showing a pinched nerve as long as you don't have arm pain. It's not dangerous to live with a pinched nerve. Along those lines, the pain that you're experiencing does not mean that you're causing irreversible damage to the nerve either. There's really only two ways to treat a pinched nerve in the neck. One is to take the inflammation off the nerve so that the nerve can learn to live in a small space. Or two, what I do, which is surgery. I can physically go in and remove that disc, remove that bone spur off the nerve. Well, today surgery is off the table. We're only talking about non-surgical techniques. In the case of a bone spur, shrinking that nerve, letting the nerve learn to live in a small space does not get rid of the bone spur. But the reality is, it's not a problem if you have and live with a bone spur or have a pinched nerve in your neck as long as it's not causing pain. Typically what happens is patients live with bone spurs for a long time, totally asymptomatically without pain. They'll do a certain activity or one day they'll just wake up with neck pain and the nerve gets inflamed. It's inflamed in a small space. So there's a cycle of inflammation. So the idea is to break the cycle of inflammation, shrink that nerve back down so that you don't have pain even though the nerve is still pinched. In the case of a disc herniation, many disc herniations, I mean the jelly, squeeze out a jelly donut, can heal itself. The body knows that jelly shouldn't be there. It will send white blood cells to destroy the jelly. And in that situation, when we treat it non-surgically, we're really trying to buy the body time to try to heal the disc. Regardless of whether or not a pinched nerve or cervical radiculopathy is coming from a disc herniation or a bone spur, one of the first things we can do that's quite effective is just medications. There's three basic categories of medications. The first category of medications we might prescribe is called anti-inflammatories. Anti-inflammatories are either NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and those include things like ibuprofen, Aleve, etc. The most important thing about an anti-inflammatory is to remember to take it consistently because you really have to break that cycle of inflammation. So in the case of ibuprofen, you would take 800 milligrams three times a day, 14 days straight with food. In the case of Aleve, you would take two tablets in the morning, two tablets at night, 14 days straight again with food. You have to build that baseline level of anti-inflammatory up to actually have an effect. You can't just take the anti-inflammatory when you have pain. The second class of anti-inflammatories is steroids. Steroids are a very strong anti-inflammatory. I don't suggest them taking them along with NSAIDs. NSAIDs are over the counter. Steroid is something that has to be prescribed, but something I would typically prescribe is prednisone. Prednisone is oral steroid. It goes everywhere in the body, and it's usually in a taper. I personally prescribe 60 milligrams a day, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, which is a five-day taper dose. 
One thing to be wary of with prednisone is that it can have certain side effects like blood sugar elevation, it can make you manic, that's where the term roid rage comes from. Uh, but prednisone is the strongest anti-inflammatory we have and I will typically prescribe that if somebody comes in with 10 out of 10 arm pain. The second type of medications that we might prescribe are narcotics. So narcotics are opiates and you've heard about the opiate crisis, but sometimes narcotics are needed when the pain is really bad. The two general types are Norco or Percocet. Both of these are combination drugs. Norco is a combination of hydrocodone plus Tylenol, which is just over-the-counter Tylenol. Hydrocodone is really the, the opiate or the narcotic, but it's a combined drug. Percocet is a combination of oxycodone plus Tylenol, and their oxycodone is the opiate or narcotic. Oxycodone is stronger than hydrocodone. The reason I've circled Tylenol is because people die from Tylenol overdosages all the time. You hear about it. The maximum amount of Tylenol you should be taking if you're taking these combined drugs is 3 grams or 3,000 milligrams of Tylenol at once. Tylenol is also known as acetaminophen. And it's always interesting to me because we regulate opiates so much, but actually what could kill you is the Tylenol could send you into acute liver failure. The third type of medicine we typically prescribe is something called a nerve medication. These are medications that trick your brain into thinking that you don't have nerve pain. There are two basic types. One is Neurontin, that's the brand name, that is exactly the same as Gabapentin, which is its scientific name. The other one is Lyrica, which is the brand name, and Pregabalin is its scientific name. These nerve drugs are interesting. In my experience, they tend to help probably 50% of the time, and they can have significant side effects. They can make you hallucinate, loopy, sleepy. These are drugs that if you look at the side effects, you're gonna say, no way am I gonna take these. However, in my experience, if you start at a low dose and slowly ramp up, you can see if you have those side effects, and if you do, you obviously stop taking it. One of the best things we do for a pinched nerve is something called a cervical epidural steroid injection. So cortisone is the same as steroid, and epidural means that it's going around the nerves in the neck. What happens with an epidural steroid injection is that instead of taking oral prednisone, where the steroid gets everywhere in the body, an epidural steroid injection takes the prednisone or steroid and puts it exactly where you need it, which is over the inflamed nerve. There are lots of different ways to do this. You talk to your physician about it, but at a very basic level, if these are the nerves that are inflamed, a needle is used filled with steroid to go over the nerve and drip a little bit of steroid over the nerve to take the inflammation off the nerve. This is typically done at a surgery center. Obviously, there are important structures in the way, like the spinal cord, the nerve, there are blood vessels there. The practitioners that do these are typically anesthesia pain management docs or physicians called physiatrists, and all they do are injections day in and day out. The people in my practice do a thousand injections a year with a very, very low complication rate, and this can be very effective. They do make you a little bit sleepy, and that's because the needle has to go in that exact perfect place over the nerve and it's done using x-ray guidance. Injections can take up to two weeks to work so if it doesn't work right away don't be concerned you have to wait up to two weeks and maybe in the first couple of days sometimes the nerve pain could even be worse. If the injection does work it means a couple of things. One we know what the problem is meaning we know it's that pinched nerve and two it's great because you're better. Sometimes, in the case of a disc herniation, it buys you enough time so that the body can heal the disc. Sometimes, in the case of a bone spur, because the bone spur is still there, your nerve might still be inflamed. I typically let my patients get up to two injections separated by six weeks. After that, I either ask that patients live with the pain or have it fixed with surgery because injections over and over again in the neck aren't great for the bone quality, the bone density, and if you're already getting two, most likely you just need to have either the pressure taken off of the nerve or need to learn to live with the pain. In addition to medications, a really good thing for a pinched nerve is physical therapy. In particular, within physical therapy is something called cervical traction. I would not recommend the cervical traction devices that you hang over the door that grab your neck because they're fairly uncontrolled. The cervical traction device that I recommend for my patients is called the Saunders cervical traction device. And this is what it looks like. Kind of does look like a medieval torture device. But the idea is that you lay flat in the device in a controlled setting. You put your neck above the cradle and as you pump 
the cradle up, it slowly puts traction on your neck. So I'll show you this device once again. There's the device. Your head would sit here, you would be laying flat, your face would be up here. This straps onto the forehead and the neck gets cradled in here and there's a pump with a gauge and as you pump this, this slowly moves upwards like so to pull on the neck like that. Here's a good example of your head sitting in the cradle and as the head is sitting in the cradle and this pumps up, it pulls up on your neck. Now, this obviously does nothing for the bone spur, but what it does do is it takes temporary pressure off of the neck to try to break that cycle of inflammation. Usually the physical therapist will trial the Saunders traction device at the physical therapy office, and if it works, then insurance will typically pay for one. So again, the idea is that it pulls up on the neck this way, cradling the neck, and creates temporary space for the nerve that's being pinched. I'll do a whole nother episode on how exactly to use the Saunders home traction device, but I've found that very, very useful. So what point do people think about having surgery? Typically it's when you have pain for over three months and really quality of life from a physical and emotional standpoint is being hindered and surgery has great outcomes. We'll talk about surgery for a pinched nerve on the next episode. There's multiple different options, including disc replacements, anterior cervical fusions, minimally invasive decompressions in the back tons of ways to treat a pinched nerve very successfully. The one thing I'll leave you with is, even though I say a pinched nerve can be treated without surgery, there are certain red flags to watch out for. Sometimes a pinched nerve can also be causing a pinched spinal cord, which is obviously a little bit more dangerous. If you're having progressive weakness, meaning your strength loss is getting worse and worse, bladder control issues, balance problems, numbness down the entire arm, down the entire leg, and marked weakness, then you need to see a spine surgeon sooner rather than later. What kind of weakness do we get worried about? I showed you how to do a strength exam on the last episode. I typically worry about weakness when it is less than three. So strength is greater from zero to five. Five is full strength, so if we're talking about the biceps, if I'm asking a patient to make a muscle and I'm resisting them, and they can completely resist me, that's a five. Three is barely anti-gravity, meaning if I tell them to bring their arm up and they can't even do this, that's a three. And zero is you can't move the muscle at all. I get worried when patients come in with a three or less. If a patient can't move their biceps against gravity, or if it's a triceps for the C7 nerve, you can put yourself flat on a bed like a Superman style and try to move your arm up like that, which is testing the triceps muscle. But if you can't even do it against gravity, that's when we get worried and you should really be seeing a spine surgeon. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you learned a little bit on how to avoid surgery for a pinched nerve in the neck or cervical radiculopathy using medications, cervical tractions, epidural steroid injections, and really just a tincture of time where if you can tolerate the pain, it will get better, I promise. Don't forget to click the like button and leave questions or feedback in the comment box below and feel free to let me know what videos you would like to see in the future about the spine.